So before we begin, I just want to make sure um, that we're rooted in recognition of the history of this place um, and the land that we're currently standing on. So I'd like to pay my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Chumash people. We understand the importance of recognizing this area's rich history and culture, both past and present, as well as the significance of a Native Americans' people's place in the learning and research activities of this university and the community life of Isla Vista. I also want to share um, a quote today. We're here because we value our democracy. We're here because we believe that our voices matter. At least that's why I'm here. So I want to share a sentiment before we begin. Power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love, implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power, correcting everything that stands against love. Um, and in honor of Black History Month, this is some, these are some words coming from Reverend uh, Dr. Lar Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm here because I love Isla Vista, and as was mentioned, I, I was a former uh, candidate for Board of Supervisors race, and I've suspended my campaign. But I want you all to know that that doesn't mean that I've silenced myself and that I am not <coughs> totally and wholeheartedly committed to seeing this place really recognize and value its future and its power. So I'm here to make sure that we're engaged, and I also want to pay particular attention. I want you all to pay close attention to who's here and who is not here. Can we snap to that? Yeah. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> so, just before we begin with the opening statements, can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, perfect. Awesome. Louder? Okay. The issue with the, you got to hear the microphone right in front of the speaker, and that's why you're just getting feedback. If you move the speaker. <coughs> Okay, we'll try one more time. Yeah, yeah, it gets in the way. If you move the speaker far into the corner, then it will stretch. Yeah, if you want to move the speaker forwards, it's not projecting towards the microphone. Speaker forward, speaker back. <laughs> Where are we? As far away from from everyone as possible. <laughs> we can only go so far. So let's test it. See how that works. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Nice. Okay, so I'm just going to read a few rules before we begin with the opening statements. Uh, so it is one mic, one voice. Please do not interrupt others while they are speaking. Please recognize and respect others' feelings, backgrounds, and cultural differences. Please respect the panelists and the moderator. Please assume the best intentions. Panelists, please try to keep responses under two minutes under two minutes each of the questions and answer segments. I will be keeping timer on a smartphone, so it is two minutes. It, it's exactly three two minutes. minutes for the opener? Yes, of course. Okay. And three minutes for the opening statements. So with that said, uh, I would like to give the opening statement to whoever would like to volunteer to go first. I'm happy to. OK. So do I take the <coughs> yes. mic? We'll, we'll test it just to make sure so you can you'll I can it, it, okay that's working <laughs> it's working all right okay. is it still working did I do is it is yeah, it working, it's working. Yeah. okay it's working uh, good evening I'm Joan Hartman I currently serve as your third district county supervisor I want to give you a little bit about my background my mother was a nurse, and she cared for my father, who was a disabled Korean War veteran. Uh, he died, leaving her a 36-year-old widow with two young children to raise. 
At that point, she did something unusual. She took a very difficult job tree, uh, working with children at the City of Hope, children suffering from cancer. That was really confusing to me. I was already a latchkey kid. Why was she going away more? Uh, but over the years, I've come to terms with what she was saying, what the lesson was, and that is that our job in life is to take on even harder tasks and to learn so that we're able to give even more back to, to the communities we serve. Um, the Santa Barbara oil spill determined my career path. I was headed towards medicine and the Santa Barbara oil spill just turned me to wanting to heal the earth. And so I became a college professor. I taught at the Claremont College's Environmental Studies and Law, Oberlin College, and then part-time later at USC. I then uh, got a law degree. I worked for the U.S. Department of the Interior, the U U.S. EPA, uh, the Coastal Conservancy in California, as well as the American Oceans Campaign. So I have spent my life, my entire life, dedicated to environmental protection. Uh, I battled Appalachian Coal Companies, created a novel partnership that was designed to uh, save coastal watership, uh, watersheds from Tijuana Estuary up to the Gaviota Coast. And now I'm really focused on the just transition to a green, renewable energy economy in Santa Barbara County. Climate change threatens our civilization and life on Earth as we have known it. I also believe that our institutions must do everything they can to promote diversity and, and inclusion. When I was a graduate student, I was the only woman in my class, and there were no women professors at my graduate school. So I know what exclusion feels like. I got a glimpse at it. In previous social justice movements, one group was always told to wait, and that we could only focus on one at a time. But I fully embrace intersectionality. These issues share a common root, exploitation, and they must be tackled head on and in concert, no one left behind. Tonight we're going to talk about many important issues, but I want to really focus on one that is the most important, and that is trust. Which of us can you trust to mean what we say and do what we promise? Tonight, uh, Bruce Porter was going to tell you that he cares about you, yet he didn't show up. He created Rock the Vote SB, an effort to suppress student votes. When exposed, he bragged to his supporters about the 1,400 fewer students registered in Isla Vista. The last time he only got 20% of the vote in Isla Vista, I got 80%. So that's why he wants to suppress the votes. Tonight, Bruce would tell you about his policies against oil. Uh, but meanwhile, he's called for farm-to-table local oil production and has accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars from oil companies. So who do you trust? I don't know if I need this microphone, and it doesn't sound like it's on anyway. <laughs> so I'm just going to put it down. I don't feel so silly. So anyway, my name is Karen Jones. And I am running for third district supervisor. I appreciate a lot of what's been said already, including uh, Jessica talking about respecting the original people of the land. Um, that would be my husband's family. My husband's family, um, his grandfather's grandfather was W.W. Twist, the first sheriff of Santa Barbara County. And his, his grandmother, great-great-grandmother, was Ramona Ortega, and she was a daughter or a granddaughter of a Chumash. We believe that she was probably a quarter because uh, the grandfather was Ortega, married a Chumash, and you will find that a lot in Santa Barbara. I don't know how many people here are from the area, but uh, people who have lived here for many generations, it would be unusual not to have a Chumash descendant, uh, a line of Chumash in your blood because there weren't a lot of people living here a couple hundred years ago. So um, I came from uh, two parents who got married at a young age, 17 and 23. I like to talk about this because Joan talks about her parents and I think it gives you an idea of who we are. Uh, my mother got married her senior year of high school. My father did not graduate from high school. He was in the Navy part of the time in the brig and the rest of the time on uh, the ship that saw the most action, the Everett. He was punished. He was recruited into the Navy to be part of a Treasure Island gambling scheme that the officers had in the Navy. My dad was an athlete. And uh, so when the, when the gambling deal got busted, who do you think got in trouble? The officers? 
No, it was the athletes, and they got put in the most dangerous situations they could so the officers could demonstrate their remorse. <laughs> so that gives you a little insight into the people I was raised by. And my parents were wonderful, but they were flawed. And the thing that I like about my parents so much is that they always model being a better person. I don't care where you start in life. If you're born into a life of what is now referred to as privilege, you can still improve your life. We all have things about ourselves that we could do better. So that's one thing that I would like to ask this group to try and remember, to always try and break your own record. Don't compete with other people, compete with yourself. Be a better person every day. And that's what my parents modeled for me. So kind of a rough upbringing. I grew up on an oil lease and uh, had a few bumps and scrapes along the way. As I said, my home life wasn't perfect. And I found myself uh, pregnant at 15 before I had ever been on a date. It would be called a violent sexual assault today, but back then we called it getting drunk when you weren't supposed to. And so people treated it a lot differently. I was a scorned person. So I ended up leaving my home. Like I said, I was born 70 miles from here. I've lived in this area the whole time. Let me just finish my, my brutal, brutal rape story here. I lived in the Salvation Army, and I will talk more about that when we discuss some of the other issues. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm gonna just dive into the first question. And I just wanna remind the audience, everybody here that, and the panelists here that all these questions are unbiased and they're questions from the community members and questions that are important to community members that want to be shared with the panelists here today. So thank you again. Okay, so first question I'm going to dive into. As supervisor, how would you work to ensure accountability, accessibility, and transparency when serving the Isla Vista community, which includes families and students? Karen, would you like to go first? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, when you talk about the Isla Vista community, it's interesting to me because You've got people who have lived here for a long time, maybe many generations. My um, son's wife's family actually had a ranch here before there was a college. And there are people that have lived here for, for a long time. Then you have the students who are often a transient population. You come for four to six years, depending. And then you have something in between that. So your question deals with accountability, and that's one of my favorite subjects. And it's one thing that I think is missing a lot in government. And I see a lot of um, work and decisions by committee. And I like having a name attached to a decision. Like if you get audited by the IRS, for example, it's really nice if you have a name of a person that you're working with. But you won't get that. You'll just get signed the IRS. So there isn't a lot of accountability in a lot of government agencies. So I think that as a supervisor, it would be an extension of how I lead my life anyway. I, um, I know that when, when I'm doing something, that my name is gonna be on it. I take pride in it, I wanna follow it through, and I know that I will be personally accountable. I think Isla Vista is going to get a lot of attention just because you make up such a big part of the voting block, and we are your local government. You have recently, in the last four years, uh, elected to have a community service district, and two years later, you elected to fund that. So that is your most local government, but the county supervisor will be representing you. So um, I don't know if that answers your question specifically, but I know that I would have an office here. I know that I would have somebody here who would uh, address your concerns, bring them directly to me. And I have a personal philosophy that I approach every problem with my personal philosophy. But part of that philosophy is being very open-minded and I am a person that uses reason. You cannot convince me with tears, you cannot convince me with bullying, but you can convince me of things that maybe I don't even so agree with now if you can answer why. Why should we do that? Tell me more. Then I'm very open to any solution that makes sense. Do I have to use that? Or, uh, Up to you. I, I, I'm not as loud as Karen, but I think I can project a bit. Uh, accountability and transparency and just showing up is extremely important. Uh, I have had a lot of criticism from my other opponent about the IV office that used to be assigned here to the third district supervisor. And that's been used as a way to say that I don't care about Isla Vista. 
Uh, it is just the opposite. What happened was um, the IVCSD, when it was first formed, uh, it didn't have a budget. It didn't have a, a, a fee to go with it, financial support to go with it. And so it needed a room of its own, and I provided that office to the IVCSD. <coughs> and what has been very exciting is uh, not only are they now financially <coughs> self-supporting, but in that office is AmeriCorps United Way that serves homeless veterans and other homeless. And they've also uh, instituted a program uh, where it's beautification and they hire veterans and homeless people to go out and take care of Isla Vista. That was actually a program I learned about elsewhere in San Jose and, and brought the idea back. The other thing that that office is used for is a, 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 a survivor resource center so that people who suffer sexual assault can use that office. So what I do is I meet with people in the community. Every month we're here with the IV network and we're here with other county people. Uh, we meet with the CSD leadership, we meet with the Ivy Rec and Park District membership. Uh, on occasion, it's not as regular, I meet with the AS, uh, EVPLA, I meet with the Chancellor on a quarterly basis, and I hold office hours in different places around. Uh, and how much time do I have? Five I'm seconds. Al I'm almost out. Okay, so I'll <laughs> <laughs> so I believe to go where the people are instead of expecting them to come to me. Okay. Um, I do have yes. a, a non-answer yes, on, on the yes, timing you. thing. Yes. Um, I think we're used to the timer being over here. Okay. And uh, not a professional radio person, but we can kind of tell when it's wrapping up and then it's not like an awkward in, like, and then I was raped. Oh. <laughs> okay. yeah, that was kind of weird. So anyway. Um, I am using a smartphone. It's unbiased. It's, I, I right. Do. No, I mean like a smartphone oh. over there. I can get okay. a computer and have a, a yeah, that would oh, probably that would be, be nice because yeah. it would help us um, pace our answers yeah, yeah. a little easier. We get so involved in what we're saying, we lose track uh, of Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right on the money as far as the amount of time, but I'm looking at the audience and so I don't know. Sure, give us, yeah, okay. <laughs> I will note that the moderator is much easier to hear right now because the microphone is working. Than actually okay. All right. All right. So, so we'll give it another go after, your, after you give us a yeah. question. Yeah. And we get the timer set up. Okay. For you. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we get the timer set up. I do want to thank the Isla Vista Community Center, beloved community, Women for Intersectional Community Action. Gaucho Gobo and AS Office of BDPLA. They are the ones who set, set this event up and gave us the platform to share questions, ideas, and comments, and we're really grateful for those organizations. Can you see this? Yes, okay. yes. Um, we do have rebuttals. You, do, you could re respond to the, your um, opponents? Yes, I went first, Joan went second, yes. and um, I would not have much to rebut there other than, mm -hmm. um, you know, I understand why she closed the office or that didn't use that position in the same way. It makes sense. I would want to have um, an office down here because I am very involved in, in the um, North County and up around the Valley, and I think it would be helpful to me where I think um, maybe you already have a lot of people down here to keep you in the loop, Joan. So, yeah. <clears throat> so I would, can I rebut the rebuttal? Yes, oh. I will keep the rebuttals to one minute. Sure, sure. Uh, what I did when I closed the office here was open an office in the Better Avia office building in North County because the two supervisors in North County are not very representative of the Latinx community there. So we hired a field representative, Alma Hernandez, who works out of that office to serve the Guadalupe, Casmalia, Tanglewood communities, which are also in the third district. Somebody who uh, speaks Spanish, who worked for 20 years 
in the Guadalupe community. And I can tell you, she, she is the sounding board for people throughout the third, fourth, and fifth districts because she's the only person who has that kind of cultural background. So that was my choice. Okay, we will be moving on to the second question. Uh, this time will be Joan, because mm -hmm. Karen, we're gonna switch. Uh, Makes sense. Yeah, between questions. So how will you include the voices of Chumash community in decision making regarding land and resources? Thank you for that question. Uh, the Chumash, there, there are five or six different Chumash bands uh, in our area. I had the opportunity, first and foremost, when I came into office, to work with the Chumash, the Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians on a Camp 4 property. Bring, that was in trust and we developed a local agreement about uh, how that land would be developed over time, and that has now been passed uh, into law by Congress. Uh, and in that process, this, this was a very contentious issue, as you will hear from Karen Jones uh, in the Valley. And in the process, I came to understand what sovereignty means from their perspective, and I, I developed a close relationship with the tribal chairman, Chairman Khan. So we have worked together very closely with the leadership hub in the San Ynez Valley. We meet monthly with the two mayors, Buelton Solvang and the tribal chair, uh, and we, we have uh, made significant strides in greater understanding. But there are also other bands of Chumash, and if you're recognized by the state, you get notices when various projects come up in the county that might affect your interests and have the opportunity to um, respond. I learned, however, with Strauss Wind Project that not all tribes are California recognized, and so not all of the bands get these notices. So I sent out notices to each and met with some, and now we have them on the notice list and they have my direct contact. So I, I learned in that process that there are a variety of voices and uh, took the initiative, uh, and that was actually with um, the help of Jessica Alvarez and others in this community who identified those interests as important ones to listen to. Oh, I got close. I think that it's important, well, I don't know, okay, I get it closer to my mouth if this helps you. Um, I think it's important to realize that the definitions um, involving the Chumash bands are white man definitions, and I'm the only native born in the race. So I grew up studying indigenous people in my community. I don't know exactly what, what my DNA is. I haven't had it checked yet. That may be something that I do. I know that my husband has his marriage and birth and all those records in his family that clearly identify as, as a Native American. It says Indian, literally, on the census forms of the 1880, 1890, all the way through the 1930s. My husband's family continued to identify as Native American, whereas many of the people that live in the Santa Inez band did not. They put Caucasian. So, it's really interesting how it's shaken out that 140 people own a casino and they've been able to rewrite their own history. There are 10 to 15,000 Chumash descendants in, in the state of California and there's really a big racket. Imagine that, a racket in gambling. Who would have guessed? And when we talk about sovereignty, go try and do some peyote there. There is not sovereignty. There's sovereignty as far as um, they can earn money through gambling and it's really gambling's a shakedown I think it's for people who are bad at math but I don't think that it should be illegal but I also don't think it should be illegal for one tribe to have it and another tribe legally can have it because what you get is you get this concentrated wealth among one small group of people once again 140 people own that casino and they get to vote who's in and who's out based on a 1938 law and that law is pre-science. You know, now we have a way to determine who is a descendant. So there's a lot of stuff. I would ask that the people in here do your homework, learn, and don't always just accept what people who it's in their benefit to tell you something and they have a financial interest in this narrative. Ah, okay. 
That's it? Uh, oh, two minutes. Oh, 159. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to respond, Rebuttal? Uh, I think the difference in opinion is clear. And a one quick one? Yes. I think the difference in fact is always important. So do your homework. Be intelligent and be informed. Okay, moving on to the third question. This one will be for Karen to start with. How will you give space and support to existing social and environmental justice related organizations such as Food and Water Actions, CAUSE, and MICOP? For um, I let me get you the definition for you and the audience. One second. So yes, it's Mesteco Indigenia Community Organizing Projects, Poteca um, Mesteco Indigenia. That's what it is. I yes. still don't understand it. Um, Can I read it? Yes. <laughs> Both of you could read it if you'd like to. I know. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, could I have a clarification? It, does, For, yes. uh, does this apply to IV or countywide? Uh, this uh, question should apply to IV. The specific one. Karen, do what? Hello? Is I'm wondering, um, did I go first or second? You're first. first. Okay. Okay. So I think the probably the most important thing to understand about me is that I believe in our system of government. I don't think that America invented freedom. I know America didn't invent freedom. The Spartacus Rebellion, the Slave Rebellion in Rome was well documented. And that was you know, 2,000 years before now. So people have long wanted to be free. What's really interesting about America and our system of government is we invented a system to protect freedom. And in uh, the wisdom of our founders, and, and this was an ideal, this wasn't exactly how, how they were living, but their ideal was that everybody would be treated equally by the government. And we gave a monopoly on force to the government to enforce individual rights. Our rights do not come from government. Our rights come from our creator. Whoever you think created you, that may be a, a, you know, a specific god, it may be mother nature, but that's where we get our rights. We get them at birth. And in America, we have a system of government that protects each one of our individual rights. And they're spelled out both in the Constitution, but specifically in the Bill of Rights, which was ratified um, several years after our country was formed. So that is what I was raised on, and that is my value system. And I noticed that there are a lot of groups now that are claiming group protection. And it scares me a little bit because two people don't have twice the rights as one person. A group of people don't have some kind of magnified rights. I still have rights as an individual. So when I hear talk about you know all these individual rights or a group rights, I think it's a threat to my individual sovereignty. If a group of people can feel like um, their rights are more important than my individual right, like I owe you something, and I don't. I don't owe anyone anything, and I don't feel like you owe me anything other than um, I expect the government to protect my individual rights. So, um, oh, two minutes, okay. That, that's where I'm coming from with all special interest groups and justice is always a consolation prize, folks. Uh, although the question goes to Isla Vista, I'm gonna start with the county because Isla Vista is part of and, and needs to be an active voice countywide. Uh, First of all, diversity of, of perspectives makes us all stronger. 
you know, all of us is smarter than any one of us. And, and this is well understood in the STEM sciences where they're actually actively recruiting underrepresented groups because it brings new insights. And so uh, diversity is something uh, I value in its own right. Uh, at the county, we've begun by language accessibility. So we have uh, emergency communications. We learned during the Thomas Fire and Debris flows we didn't have adequate emergency notifications. The 211 numbers, and now I'm working to have, our website is now in Spanish, and I'm working to make sure that we have uh, our board meetings in Spanish as well. Uh, the county also gives grants to uh, Mesteco. It's not um, a written language, and so we do have uh, people from various county departments and social services and uh, in, in the criminal justice system to be able to translate and work with those. So that's very important. We also have a, a diversity and inclusion manager, and that person's job is to make sure that county departments up and down reflect the people that they serve and are culturally sensitive to the people they serve. Now I want to go into something uh, a little personal, and this goes back um, to Jess. Um, Jess worked for my campaign, and when she worked for the campaign, she was beating on my door and saying, you're not listening to certain groups, and I want you to hear. And I said, I'm busy, I, I gotta do, you know, I gotta do this and register, and I'll, I'm busy, I'm busy. And, and uh, so she decided to run herself. Uh, and I'll have to get to this in the rebuttal, but I'll, I'll save it if you won't give me the time now. I do want a rebuttal, and uh, how much time do we have on the rebuttal? One, one minute. Okay, very good. You know, um, not just Joan, a lot of people probably in this room talk a lot about diversity, and I'm sitting here as your diversity. I have diversity of ideas, and um, I went to a thing last week by the women, um, Women's Commission, the county funds with tax dollars a Women's Commission for women in leadership. I'm the president of my CSD. I serve as a director on the airport authority. None of these people have ever contacted me. None of these people have ever supported me because they only support uh, what you might call progressive or left-wing women. I think I'm very progressive, but not by the political definition. So anyway, when we hear about diversity, it seems like really just something to slant the political um, take of things because diversity is rejected in my case. I'm the only native born running. I am the only registered Republican running. I'm the only pro individual liberty person running. And I would be that on the board. I only have a GED. How's that for some, some diversity folks? Thank you. Uh, so I want to return to uh, the role that Jess has played in my life and my campaign. Uh, I was focused, as I said, on the nuts and bolts of registration, and I missed the opportunity that she offered. Uh, I didn't listen, and she decided to run and represent those new voices. But as we engaged in forums like this, we realized that we shared a lot of common goals. And I realized that she could be a bridge to those new voices and bring those to the fore and, and help me better understand uh, EcoVista, Sunrise, and others. And uh, as I listened, I got very excited about a Green New Deal in Isla Vista. I got very excited about the tremendous opportunities we have to listen to these new voices and bring them to the fore. So there are various structural ways we can address that through a municipal advisory committee, a public ad uh, advisory committee, uh, regular meetings. Uh, and also a sustainability committee in the county to advise on our renewable energy transition uh, and getting IV people involved in that. Thank you. This question would be for John to start with this time. And the question is, how do you plan on building a fair and just economy in Isla Vista across the third district and the county? Um, <clears throat> economic vitality is really key to uh, a healthy community and uh, a healthy economy and a government that's able to deliver the services that we need. For me, uh, the role of government particularly is to provide the underlying infrastructure 
for an economy. So in North County, we don't have broadband, and we're working now to get a ring net uh, broadband that communities can tie into. That will be very key for economic development up there. Sustainable, renewable, predictably uh, uh, priced energy will be also very important. You can't, uh, most companies are trying to locate where they can depend on energy, they're not facing power shutoffs, where they can depend on water, uh, and where there's good transit. And so those are all things that government can do to support a healthy economy. I have been meeting regularly with Chancellor Yang and with uh, Vice Chancellor Joe in Candela working on the uh, entrepreneurship and innovation program and how we can bring that into Isla Vista, how we can develop Isla Vista to be supportive of that program and to be able to keep graduates here in Isla Vista. We've all invested in people who go to school here. This is a treasure, this is a brain trust. And we need to develop the housing, we need to develop the work live space in Isla Vista that is attractive to keep people here. And we need to address the issue of workforce housing. That's the number one. Uh, we had an intern uh, working in our CEO's office from Isla Vista, and she did the survey, and the number one issue is workforce housing. We lose people because they can't stay here. So we have to address that issue, and I'm very much committed to doing just that. Oh, sorry. Yes. This way. Could you repeat the question? How do you pl uh, how do you plan on building a fair and just economy in Isla Vista across the third district and the county? There is that phrase, fair and just. Justice really is a consolation prize, folks. I don't know why you're all big on justice. It's what you get after you've been screwed if you're lucky. Gonna... Not interested in using that anymore. So, anyway, I think the best thing that the government can do is, you know, we've got about, I don't know, $500 million in deferred maintenance. We have a lot of deferred maintenance. I think the number one job of the county is to provide public safety and to maintain our roads, bridges, um, do that basic stuff. And then as far as the economy, they can stop nanny-stating private business and allow people to do what they do because innovation happens in the private sector. Joan has spent a lifetime working in government and she's met some really educated, neat people like herself, but they really are not the experts on innovation or the private sector. So I think, um, you know, Joan talks about uh, renewable energy. My father-in-law worked for Flying A in Cat Canyon back in the uh, 40s when he got back from World War II. He fought with the 144th Field Artillery Unit and that was a great place for a guy without a high school education to uh, learn skills. He became a mechanic in the Army, and he used those skills to advance uh, working in the oil fields. My husband worked in the oil fields, and he became an automation specialist. So he was able to get a really good job, a high-paying job with good benefits. And I've met a lot, so many people my whole life. Joan talks about STEM jobs. This is it. I mean... Fossil fuel production, those involve STEM jobs. That's not just a bunch of meatheads doing that. These are very sophisticated jobs. And I also think that it's important to realize that fossil fuels are solar energy. That is stored solar energy, folks. That is through photosynthesis. The breakdown of plants became oil, and we harvest it now for energy. So the question is, how do you plan on building, the question was, how do you plan on building a fair and just economy in Isla Vista across the third district and the county? Thank you. So, I, I just add a little bit if I can. It's not really a rebuttal. Okay. Should I talk? Yeah. Okay. That's the devil. <laughs> I think we figured it out. <laughs> I just wanted to add two points. I mean, fair and, uh, uh, the broadband initiative in North County, which is very rural, uh, and many children in schools don't have fast access, so that I, I, is part of the fair and just. 
I, I wanted also to mention the Hourglass Project. That is something with the closure of Diablo Nuclear Power Plant that we're looking at uh, jobs at Vandenberg Air Force Base in the private space launch business. That uh, is communication satellites, manufacturing up in space. Uh, the real connection has been with Cal Poly because United Launch Alliance president graduated from Cal Poly. They wanted money from the county and I said the only way we can fund this is if you link up with UCSB, which has material science and tremendous uh, opportunity for, for both parties to benefit. So we did bring the leaders of the Hourglass Project down here to meet with uh, people at UCSB and uh, that is in the works. Um, and I just want to mention, I mean, the things like LEDs, appeal, Inogen, quantum computing. I mean, this is the center for the new economy that gets us beyond agriculture and tourism, which are lower paid jobs. Yeah, uh, and my rebuttal, just because I know that this room is pretty monolithic in your opposition to fossil fuel, and once again, I would ask you to be open-minded, do your research, and do as I do. Listen to people you disagree with, then fact check them, and gain knowledge before you form an opinion. Whenever you're in a room where everyone agrees with you, you should be nervous. I mean, that's not a good look. <laughs> So I think skepticism is healthy, and I would ask you to be skeptical about the uh, anti-fossil fuel thing because the innovation that has happened in production of fossil fuels is amazing. And I see many people, we're using a computer here, um, your phones, everything, 86% of our electricity relies on fossil fuels right now. And maybe that won't be the reality at some point, but fossil fuels are not all the devil, and they have really been cleaned up. There's a lot of, of efficient uses of fossil fuel, including uh, there are trucks now, that big trucks that pull trailers, they get 30 miles to the gallon. I work at the uh, airport board, One minute. and maybe we'll have electric planes someday. But we don't have them now. Thank you. <laughs> we do. They can't, they can't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, so the next question would be for Karen start with as supervisor what would you do to make housing more accessible to students and recent grads who want to continue calling santa barbara county home but cannot otherwise afford it two points i would like to make i, I have said repeatedly that i am not educated i've got a ged a vocational license i worked in mental health um, my children live here and they're nurses, one uh, works for Zoom, another one is a legal, uh, paralegal, and they bought houses here, and it was very difficult, especially when you have the property tax on, and I see a lot of signs saying yes on 13, bad move if you wanna live here, because my kids are paying as much property tax, as, actually more property tax than I paid on my first mortgage. So make sure you do your research there. Um, but I think that the number one thing that the government can do to make housing affordable is to cut out the regulations and cut down the taxes. There are a lot of things that the government does that makes housing less affordable and it's really hard for a small developer to do a project here because it's so expensive that you only get these really big wealthy developers who are able to pay millions of dollars sometimes in, in uh, revising their plans repeatedly. So I think that uh, less regulation, I'm not saying to not have a building code, but cut back on the planning and development if you wanna make housing more affordable. Um, some other things, I am very much in favor of things like the university, hospitals, fire departments. Uh, for people that provide essential services in our community, maybe those different organizations should provide housing. And I believe Cottage Hospital does some of that. And I know that I worked for a hospital that provided housing, especially for the first year that you worked there. But uh, the college can continue to do that. And I know that uh, people have offered to build housing for the college, and I would take advantage of that. I would also do things, once again, the really difficult regulations make it hard on good landlords. There are some good landlords, but sometimes they get driven out and then only the bad landlords are there. The good guys go because the rules can just be a little too tough. Thanks. So housing, especially workforce housing, is a top priority in California. We have a huge shortage have to build 180,000 every year for the next 10 years, according to the, uh, the governor's office. Um, here in Isla Vista, 
The problem is really exacerbated by the fact that the legislature mandated a, an increase in enrollment of 5,000 students. So that means that the university has 5,000 units they need to build. They also need to build 1,800 to support the faculty and staff, and they haven't done that. And the result is that it drives up rents for everybody else in Isla Vista and in Goleta. And landlords can take advantage of that. Rents in Santa Barbara County have gone up three times faster than the cost of living. So there's not really a reason for that to happen. So we are working hard to force the university to follow through on their required mandate. They have to provide this housing. As they do, that means that Isla Vista will have more space available. And we can have a circulation plan and see, do we really need all these cars or can we redesign this? Uh, can we build this kind of work, uh, live space, and higher quality housing to keep families and uh, people here? Um, also, uh, the, the legislature has, for community colleges, explored safe parking programs uh, for community colleges. We could do that here at, at UCSB, demand that, or ask or work with, encourage uh, them to do the same. Uh, there's also tiny houses, uh, county land available for, for various kinds of housing. So uh, these are all various things. The county will be getting a requirement in October for our new housing. That happens every five to eight years. My goal is to work regionally and not just uh, city by city to see how we can best uh, situate housing for the future, workforce housing, not second homes. I think Joan makes an excellent point about the governor mandating uh, things like 5,000 more students. Maybe we ought to get a new governor because you can't always keep fitting more rats in the aquarium. And right now we have a super majority. Well, I mean, and I know at our high school right now, you can, you can be shocked by this, but right now we have 32% uh, uh, prepared students for math and I think it's 46 for English. So maybe not everybody needs to go straight into the university. Maybe some people need to do some prereqs at a community college and get up to speed, but I don't think everybody needs to go to university. It's, uh, I think that's just probably wrong-headed thinking, especially if you're not uh, prepared to learn. So I have a little more to add to um I participate in a five-county group that's looking at how uh, some of the Central Coast issues specific regarding housing. Uh, and what we have done in our county is we have created uh, accessory dwelling units, sort of granny apartments. So any area, agriculture or residentially zoned, you can build this with streamlined permit requirements. We've also streamlined farm worker housing uh, uh, so that it can get through the permit process more easily. Um, what we found in the first meeting of this five county group is that Central Coast counties have similar issues. We have uh, new constraints having to do with fire, having to do with water moratoria, having to do with floods, sea level rise, uh, the need to redress the jobs housing imbalance, uh, and the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we don't have people driving from further away. So these are all some of the constraints that we need to consider as we think where are we going to locate housing. Uh. Okay. Next question would be for Joan to start with. So the question is, do you support the movement of UC grad students organizing for a cost of living adjustment at UCSB and elsewhere? What would you do as supervisor to ensure support for a similar labor movement? Thank you. Uh, I am a huge supporter of organized labor. Countries that have strong unions have less inequality. The inequality in our country today is really inexcusable. It's the greatest it's ever been. And uh, they, they measure this by the Gini Index. Economists have developed this. And uh, we're, we're far more inequality than other uh, developed nations. 1% uh, of the people have 40% of the wealth. You don't see that in countries where there's strong labor unions. And this threatens our politics. It, it really it, it threatens uh, 
our economy. Uh, Trump passed a tax benefit for it serves 83% of the 83% of the benefit goes to that top 1%, and it's all on borrowed money. And what's going to happen is that not only do you have huge college debt, not only do you have high housing costs, not only do you face global warming, but you're going to have a federal deficit, and they're going to cut back on social safety net services. So this is the kind of world that we're coming into. So yes, I support unions. I uh, am supporting a project labor agreement. Uh, my opponent, Mr. Porter, is, is slamming me everywhere for supporting unions in these nasty doctor, I don't know which is worse, the pictures or, or <laughs> I, I, I believe in organized labor and uh, I do support the graduate students. I am not a fan of organized labor because it's collectivist, it's anti-individual, and Mr. Porter also supports big labor, by the way. One thing that I had, uh, I have experience, I sat through much of his history um, when he was serving on the high school board. He was put into office by the teachers union. He immediately put uh, all public employee union people in place in our high school. And we lost our board that was very diverse, made up from people from the community. Maybe a one or two might have been in the union, but he replaced our board with a 100% all union board. And so then they catered to the teachers union. And our teachers, a lot of them may be in the union, but they are not big on the union. It's just, you know, comes with the territory. And so a lot of times our teachers and students get the short end of the stick because of the big union people. Now specifically with the grad students here, that's a problem. Uh, my oldest son left his graduate program because he couldn't afford it anymore, you know, by teaching bowling or whatever, getting paid uh, pittance. But um, once again, maybe the university in order to retain health needs to provide housing and provide better benefits. That's something, uh, you know, it's too bad that the, the union is doing it because when I was elected, I have a very strong individual rights message. And so when I was elected to our CSD, we have six employees there. The Teamsters uh, International sent up people, filled our, our meeting room, and tried to intimidate me. These guys were from El Monte, and they were sending the message. And anyway, well, now we've got a, a Teamster shop. It's really ridiculous. Because we can negotiate salaries, people can work things out, and the school needs these uh, grad assistants. So I think that they will be able to reach some sort of agreement because things have to be mutually beneficial. But when Joan talks about countries with strong unions, yeah, like the Soviet Union, like uh, communist China, I see a lot of totalitarianism and I see Marxism. I see private property being seized and I think that's a very dangerous road for us to go down. Once again, you can laugh at me, but do your research. They don't yeah, they do them. not have unions in China, and they have horrible, horrible work conditions. Uh, it's also the coronavirus. <laughs> I guess that's all I want to say. Yeah, are we doing a free-for-all? Should we interact with the audience now? Or? Yeah. I want to remind the audience to just please respect the panelists here. Okay. And I, I do. That was a the fact check, check, which you called on us to do. Oh, I could I? Yes. I, I did think of what I wanted to say. Okay, I was a gypsy scholar going from place to place as a, as a teacher uh, when I was a graduate student, so I have a lot of empathy for that. Uh, and more and more universities are hiring people as teacher's assistants and then not really investing. And they don't have the ability to, to office hours and invest in all the committees at the university. So that's, uh, they should be paid well. Uh, my mother, as I mentioned, was a nurse. She was very active in the California Nurses Association, and the result was uh, that conditions have improved tremendously for nurses, the hours, the pay, uh, and most of all, the conditions in which how many nurses per patient. First of all, I call on you to challenge yourself, not to heckle the people at the table. So just in case anybody else misunderstood that, what I'm calling for you to do is you all have a certain point of view and it's very consistent with universities. And I'm telling you that if you really value diversity, look at another opinion. 
And no, China doesn't have unions. They are a union. They're one big communist party. So I'm saying that, that I have had very negative uh, experience with unions, and I see some unions solely existing to intimidate. Now, there are time and place where organizing is good, and that's a voluntary alliance, and I have no problem at all with that. But I think these worker, workers' unions typically are not that, and I think they're heavy-handed, and I think that they often are, are designed to intimidate. So um, I would like to see that the people who are graduate students here work something out. They're going to do it with the union, and maybe that's poetic justice for the people that um, you know, teach you all how great unions are. Thank you. Thanks. OK, this question will now go to Karen to start with. Given that there will be dispensaries established soon in IV, what would, you, what would be the pros and cons of this, and how would we ensure that this growing market benefits IV? I would like to start by saying that I am the only candidate, in addition to being the only native candidate, I am the only candidate that has spent the majority of my life around marijuana. I still occasionally smoke marijuana, but I smoke marijuana daily for a period of time, including when it was a felony. So I have more experience with marijuana than the other two candidates, without a doubt. And throughout my life in California, long before Joan or Bruce lived here, this was an ongoing topic, legalizing marijuana. And finally, it was decriminalized when I was a young adult. Um, and that was OK. That was kind of like the don't ask, don't tell of marijuana. But you know, I like the idea of marijuana being legal, but I don't like the idea of marijuana being government run. It, the government, you, you've heard my, my feelings on when the government gets involved, it very rarely makes things better. And I uh, like to make the point, Bill and Melinda Gates do not give the money to government to do good works. They keep the money and do it themselves because even liberals like, like uh, in the Gates Foundation know that the government is not who you go to to get something done right. And I feel that way about marijuana. So I never got a marijuana card when we could first like say we were sick and get a card so we want to get arrested. I'm not going to play that game. I think it's bullshit. I've smoked marijuana. I've gotten it from the same family farm. Maybe. I will not uh, confirm or deny. But I know where my marijuana comes from. I know it's safe. I know that it's grown pesticide free and it's uh, grown in a way that is, is uh, friendly to the environment. It's away from children. And so I went to a legal marijuana store in LA after the uh, legalization passed. And I was so caught off guard when they scanned my driver's license. They're like, you effing kidding me? I've spent my whole life not getting in bed with the government. And ugh, it felt so dirty. So IV, you've got, uh, I, I think it's a sad day that you're going to be buying marijuana that is completely regulated by the government. It doesn't sound very fun or free to me. Uh, well, <clears throat> cannabis, uh, if it's not regulated, can be quite contaminated and create a lot of problems for people. In our county, we were heading towards a lottery system for each community plan area uh, so that basically uh, qualifying retail merchants would be picked out of a hat. And I attended an IV network meeting and people said to me, hell no, we don't want that. You go back and change the county's mind because we want a merit-based system. If you're going to grant a monopoly in Isla Vista that generates a lot of money for this retailer, we want a community benefit. And so I went back, and that's what happened. And we had to change course. I mean, they were already on the way towards doing this uh, lottery system. And uh, now in the spring, we'll be, uh, soon we'll be having community meetings to say, what is a community benefit in this community? What do you want to see? And in many places, a certain percentage of profits are dedicated to a nonprofit organization. And so I'll be hosting that meeting, and we'll be hearing. And then ultimately, the assessment of the retail applicant, uh, various applicants, will be made according to what the community has identified as their, uh, as their goals, their objectives, their needs. And that will differ by community. I'll take all the time I can get because 
you know, maybe you weren't that impressed with my educational background, but I do know weed, folks, and I know it a lot better than the other two candidates for a fact. And I got to say, this lottery thing, talk to some weed dealers about it. They're like the rich people are manipulating the lottery. So you can, you can have all these feel-good things, but it's still not going to be fair, it's still not going to be free, and it's still going to be very um, just prone to, to the government. I mean, golly gee, that just really blows my mind that people sitting here, they, I would expect university students or people that would be at this, uh, this forum to be a little more open-minded about this stuff. And so in San Inez, we have got corporate marijuana uh, growers coming in, buying up land, forcing out the family farmers I was talking about, and we've got this money sovereign casino there, and so we've got barrels of cash at the casino, barrels of cash at the corporate grow, and it's just scary because they use that money to pay politicians. This question's for John to start with this time. So, what do you propose for environmentally responsible actions on campus? For instance, with plastic and food scrap waste, what do you propose to do with increasing recycling retention or food scrap retention on campus? For example, at SBCC, Santa Barbara City College, we are working to decentralize recycling and create a community point to bring in plastic that would otherwise go to landfills and shredding it down to create new products with it. Would you be willing to support initiatives like this? Thank you. So as I understand the question, it has both to do with green waste, which uh, can be uh, degraded and, and recycled, and, and plastics, with single-use plastics, which cannot. So let me first start with uh, the green waste. Uh, as a gardener myself, um, I'm very, uh, I compost, it's not that easy always, but um, it, it is something that is very important to me. It al is also very important to the state. We have state laws trying to reduce green waste because they go into the landfill and take up space in limited landfills. So uh, it's much better to, to compost and uh, renew make it renewable, get it back into the soil. Uh, Countywide, I'm working actively on a program that uh, creates compost, applies it in fields, and it is a greenhouse gas, uh, it, it, uh, it captures greenhouse gas and reduces greenhouse gases, captures water, holds water like a sponge, and also improves uh, the quality of the soil. Um, in Isla Vista, our county public works, we have a guy, Sam, and he loves green waste. And he has worked with the, um, the various uh, commercial kitchens and the, um, the fraternities and sororities to collect clean green waste. It has to be clean. And so he, uh, I think he's tripled or quadrupled or maybe by now quintupled uh, the number of participants in this collecting the green waste. And that's really exciting. We're also looking for a drop-off site for green waste. Uh, again, it has to be clean, so there have to be hours. It has to be manned. Uh, and we're working with the uh, advisory committee of the new community center to see where we could locate it centrally uh, we're also looking at a community garden uh, that will go through that group as well and see if we can out here actually have a garden that is fertilized by the waste. Well, if there's one thing I know as much as I know about weed, it's recycling. I'm a Dust Bowl descendant and my grandmother invented recycling. She would take her bread wrapper and cut it, wash it, and hang it on the clothesline and use it for her cellophane. Uh, saved everything, reused everything. My husband is the same way. But we have done it long before there were laws because we were just people that um, try to live a good life, and that's part of it. And it's really interesting when we talk about the plastic and the recycling, I would once again ask you guys to get informed about this. You know China is no longer taking our, our plastic recycling and their bales just stacking up at ports right now. Because China used to take our plastic and shred it up and do whatever they do to it and make clothes and send them back and we buy them at Ross. But um, you know, a lot of the plastic junk we bought is just recycled trash. 
So that's a, that's fine. Go ahead and do that if you want. I like having the same mixing bowls I've had for 40 years rather than using plastic ones. It's just my personal style. I'm using this glass, this cup right here because I didn't want to be shamed with my um, electrolyte uh, drink that I drink. It's a single use bottle. I recycle that. The proceeds go to my local thrift store because Joan is right. Recycling needs to be clean. And so much of what we're recycling does not have a use. So it does need to go in the landfill. And landfills do a very efficient job, and I think eventually they're gonna be a primary source of our um, energy because we're gonna be able to very efficiently pull methane out of landfills and power with it. So we innovate. That's the cool thing about living in a place that's free where there are free thinkers because innovation happens, and that's gonna happen with trash. But beware, this, uh, the, we had this message when we started about good intentions. Good intentions are worthless, folks. Good behavior is what matters. And so everybody with their, their big hearts and the recycling have actually created a problem by keeping things out of landfills that should have went into the landfill. Thank you. So for my rebuttal, uh, in quotes, I'd like to talk about single-use plastics. I learned a lot about this from Food and Water Watch as well as CalPERG. Uh, the fracking that is occurring nationwide is creating a gas ethane, and that is being, that, that's a key uh, constituent of plastics, single-use plastics in particular. So we're now exporting this ethane to the European Union, to China, uh, to anybody who will take it in big ships. Uh, and we're encouraging the production of single-use plastics as a means of making sale of the products of fracking. So if we want to eliminate fracking, a place to start is reducing the demand, reducing single-use plastics. This is a very powerful lobby, uh, and there have been efforts uh, at the state level to, to deal with this. Some cities are dealing with it. I know UCSB already, many of the stores uh, have um, uh, recyclable rather than single-use plastics. So that's the direction, and I'm eager to figure out how to address this better. And I get a rebuttal also. I, I agree that we shouldn't make a lot of plastic stuff, and I try and limit my use of it. As I say, I have a certain electrolyte drink that I use, and I'm not going to shame people. Maybe people wear makeup. I don't wear makeup. I buy recycled clothes most of the time. I shop at my local thrift store. So, I mean, I do a lot of things that are healthy, but I don't go around trying to be a scold shaming people who are using things I don't. I live in a 900-square-foot house that was built out of used redwood in 1920. The redwood came from the college school. I don't have air conditioning. The county building is four stories of air conditioning. Now I drive a diesel car and I drive under 7,000 miles a day. So I do responsible use myself. But once again, I'm not into shaming people. I think education is the best thing to do. And when we talk about single use plastic, you wanna see where they use a lot of single use plastic? Go to the hospital. Everything is single use there, and it's keeping little babies alive and saving your mom, keeping your grandma healthy, whatever it is. So we do need to get rid of the thing that offends me, but I don't shame people, are these people pushing their big cart at Walmart with all this plastic toys and crap, and it's like, ugh. But I don't shame them. I just suck it up and don't do it myself. So, next question would be for Karen to start with. What are your views on what could be done to increase mental health services and real access to all? Well, when I wasn't uh, managing the clock well, I started out with my, my own uh, start into adulthood at 15, living in the Salvation Army. I got my GED there. Um, spent eight months at the Salvation Army, and then I went and lived with my grandmother, the original recycler, and I went to an adult school and got my psychiatric technician license. Never heard of a psychiatric technician. I scored well on a test for adult school. I go, ooh, you can go in the psych tech program. So I got a psych tech license, and that uh, enabled me to work in lock psych. I had never been on a lock psych unit before. Imagine being 18 and going in a mental hospital. It was really wild. But I was a quick learner. And I learned a lot about um, different kinds of holds that people uh, get placed, a 5150, a temporary conservatorship. I used to transport patients. I eventually became one of two special treatment program directors um, 
that, or approved by the state without a master's degree from college because I had the experience. And in this special treatment program, it was for long-term like lock site patients, and we had contracts with both Ventura and Santa Barbara County. So just as I am the only person in this race that is native born, I'm the only person in this race who has actually worked a number of years in mental health. So I have a lot of solutions and I understand the problem in a way that other people running do not because I understand it from a very compassionate side as somebody that was in a living in, in the Salvation Army. And I always thought when I was working lock psych, especially the emergency uh, uh, unit uh, at Kern Medical Center, it was called Kern General Hospital then, I always thought it was a better day to be locked in a mental ward when I was working. And it was because I really felt these people, and, and some people are just so far gone, they really don't have much to hang on to. And I think that I'm really good with people in that situation. Thank you. Well, I have to acknowledge that I worked for the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute when I was a college student, so I do have a little experience as well. But mental health issues affect every family uh, in, in our country, and certainly in our state and in our county. One in five people suffers from a mental illness each year, uh, and including my own family. We have bipolar and schizophrenia, and I can tell you uh, it is very, very difficult. I attended a forum several years ago at UCSB. It was a forum put on by students to destigmatize mental illness so that uh, others would, students, roommates would learn what it's like. And there were panels of, of young people who were actually experiencing bipolar or claustrophobic, uh, and it was one of the most profound things I ever attended. Uh, that they were willing to share their stories and that we understood what it took for them to get here and what it takes for them every day to get through class. Uh, my husband was a college president and we were there uh, new for a week uh, and a young man, a, a Latino from Chicago, depressed, we didn't know about it, committed suicide. Uh, he was the first generation from his family. So uh, mental health issues are very, very significant. Um, because th this, is, this is so intertwined with other issues, having to do with homelessness, having to do with criminal justice. And we at the county have uh, a new initiative called Renew 2022, where these departments are working together. That means we have got now $3 million per year over the next four years to address these in a way that's focused, coordinated, and has the resources needed. So um, I, I'll talk about something else next go round. And just a quick rebuttal, because, and it's not really a rebuttal as much as adding to my own experience, it's really hard to talk about these big issues in little bites of a minute or two minutes, but I think that one thing that gets confused a lot is people talk about affordable housing for homeless. Most of the homeless people need treatment beds. They don't need a house. They need a place to live that is safe. And also when we talk about um, the mentally ill, they need a safe, clean, therapeutic setting. In many cases, they need medication, but also we as a community need to be safe. There was a, um, a person that was stabbed to death with their daughter on their lap at the pier. That person was obviously a paranoid schizophrenic. A generation ago, he probably would have been treated in Camarillo Hospital. Instead, he's living just, you know, dumpster diving around Ventura, not kind to him and certainly not kind to the family and the little girl uh, that saw her father just have his life drained out of, out of him. So I, I wanted to tell you just about one response, uh, one program called Co-Response that the county has. Used to be if there was a 911 call, the sheriff's deputies would go out, the situation would escalate, there'd be more and more offenses. Pretty soon the the, uh, the person suffering some kind of a mental breakdown would be brought to jail uh, and there not get the medical medication and treatment and just sit there. And I would get the emails from frantic parents of adult children just not knowing what to do. And because of HIPAA and because of uh, attorney client, the, there was very little I could even learn about to tell them. Now we have every deputy 
trained uh, at least eight hours, now it's going up to 40 hours. But more importantly, we have what is called a co-response team. A psychologist going out with the sheriff's deputy who are specially trained to do this, and they de-escalate. So that has made all the difference. We have more money to get this pilot. We have three more programs starting. And we also uh, have new programs to direct people away from jail and into treatment. Thanks. So I just want to remind the audience we will, we will be ending soon, uh, coming close to an end. And there's two questions left, and then we'll be moving on to the closing statements. So uh, we won't be accepting any new uh, questions from the audience. Thank you. So Jones is for you. So how have you supported the Isla Vista Community Service District since 2016? And what would you do to support the Isla Vista Community Service District? Thank you. I campaigned very hard at, and, and raised money and contributed money for the IVCSD to be passed. No more about us without us. I really believe in local government and having people elected, having a partner I can work with. I also work to have the uh, the, the financial, the fee adopted, uh, that was, uh, it would have dissolved if that hadn't happened. Uh, Mr. Porter claimed he supported the CSD, but he didn't support the fee. Uh, so that's kind of his uh, both ways, Bruce uh, way of approaching it. As I said, I gave uh, my office and I have worked uh, with the CSD. We're transferring the community center uh, to, we have trans, we have an agreement and uh, we'll probably be doing a long-term agreement. They manage this room. Uh, I meet weekly, uh, I'm sorry, monthly with the CSD board. So we are, um, I'm very, is it just, oh. This is Oh, oh, okay, sorry, thank you. Little change here. So, so I have been very supportive of the CSD and local government here in Isla Vista. I, I also want to mention the IV Rec and Park District Board. They are also a, an elected board and a very important partner for all of us. So um, I, I am happy to say that the elected, most elected members of the CSD board have actually endorsed my candidacy because we do have a very close working relationship. Yeah, I believe they endorsed your candidacy before there was a CSD. Um, yeah, um, I love the CSD. I am the first woman elected to the Santa Inez Community Service District. And I shared a little bit earlier how the Teamsters responded to me being elected. But my peers on the board, now we have a majority on the board. The voters have sent uh, new blood into the board. So I've been elected president for the last two years on that CSD. And I think it's really important because local people get what their, their town needs. And so I think it's a wonderful thing. And I love that you guys have a CSD now. So I wasn't involved in supporting it in actuality. I supported it in spirit. And uh, when I talked to people, I thought it was a good thing. But um, I do not think that I played the role that Joan has played in starting the CSD, but I completely approve of it. And in my own work with the Community Service District, um, in 1995, we had a special problem area in Santa Inez identified, and we annexed this neighborhood by the high school and they've just been sitting there paying um, a little nominal fee to be part of the district. Well, we finally are providing a mainline sewer extension to them because we can afford it. We're very healthy. Our, our community service district in Santa Inez is financially healthy, and we don't always need to um, make the numbers work in that way when it's a special problem. Once again, I like to pay as I go. I don't like uh, big spending. I don't like big government. But when people can tell me, here's a need and this is why, I respond. And I am a doer. So on the community service district, you have somebody like me who responds to something and gets it done when it's just been languishing for a number of years. So I'm, I'm confident that you guys have that on your community service district board. I appreciate Jay Freeman coming and recording our CSD meetings. I've been asking to have videotape meetings for my first two years when I was in the minority. So anyway, I, I like your, uh, your CSD. 
Um, so I just wanted to add a couple of things uh, that we're working on with the CSD. The first has to do with um, a partnership that uh, the county has been very focused on sidewalks, and sidewalks are indeed important for safety. But we heard from AS and we heard from the CSD that even more important was lighting. And so they, uh, AS led the effort and the CSD supported it and developed a whole database on all the lights and what kind of lights and where they were and how they could be improved. So we got public works and everybody involved and we did a field trip on a dark night uh, and, and we, uh, we we actually made notes about all of these. So we've had the first phase of the light improvement program, and the second phase is waiting on Edison for, for, um, uh, for uh, the, the, what the, these arms that are in it's short done. supply. It's done. Oh, it's done! It's done! Oh, we have the lights! Oh, <laughs> thank you. So that really is, that, that shows the importance of the CSD, the AS partners working together about what's really important in the community. Uh, okay. And then I have just to. I also just like to make the point that uh, the partnership is great and I, I would look forward to working with CSDs where I can, particularly if I am an uh, alternate on LAFCO, but that the county does not have any authority over CSDs. They are a separate authority and uh, they do have latent powers of lights, sidewalks, and roads. And I don't know if that's true in, in Isla Vista. It is true in Santa Inez. And so um, right now we're talking about um, to some people about um, looking at implementing some uh, trail areas that are identified on our valley plan. I don't know if we're going to do it or not, but uh, that's something. And as our town, we want to retain the rural character of Santa Inez. That's what most of the, at least the voters that I talk to, we don't want sidewalks, we don't want lights in our neighborhood yet, but we have that option and we can, we can activate those latent powers as the people who elect us choose to do that. So that's something that, you know, your CSD has different, um, different uh, things that they wanna do than our CSD and that's why I think it's really important that even though we're all in Santa Barbara County, that our CSD responds to the people that live within our district as does yours. Thank you. So we will be moving on to the last question. And a disclaimer, this, as a community member, this is my question. And I, this is a very, very close question to my heart and to, I'm sure, many, many members of the community. So this would be for Karen to start. Uh, the question is, if elected, what would you do to bring about greater awareness about some of the marginalized communities like African Americans, LGBTQ+, Hispanics and others. As an Armenian American, it is particularly important for me and my community that the tragedy of Armenian genocide is properly taught and commemorated with the aim of preventing such atrocities in the future that goes alongside with the Holocaust. Would you like to designate cultural awareness months or other initiatives aimed to secure better understanding and harmony in our community? No, I would not. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Martin Luther King. I look at people, I don't see color, I don't see sexual orientation, I don't even see sex. I'm talking about being the first woman elected to the CSD only because that seems to be something voters care about. To me, I didn't even consider that I was the first woman elected until I was running for supervisor. And you know, it's coming up at, at uh, these different forums. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I'm the first woman elected to the CSD. And when I was elected to the airport authority board, I was one woman, eight men on a board of nine. Um, Gavin Newsom, your, our governor, has um, signed a law saying that two out of the five board members on a publicly traded board must be women. And yet, our own supervisor isn't endorsing the woman running against uh, the male in the first district, or is, is that second district? First district. Uh, first district race. So when we're putting our own groups together, we don't always follow this forced diversity thing. And I'm glad. I'm glad you're not going based on what people are like naked. Like, that doesn't matter to me at all. It's what people think. It's their ideas. That's where the diversity comes in for me. And I appreciate, when you talk about the Armenian genocide, 
I got to know a lot of Armenian folks because I lived in the Central Valley, and I took it upon myself to learn, but I think that's a really important thing for schools to teach, and I think it is absolutely essential that we are curious about other people and we seek that out. But for the government to pick winners and losers, and you know, once again, nobody, uh, this woman's commission didn't even acknowledge me for these uh, last four years. So I think a lot of these, uh, you know, the diversity police are really, you know, they don't seem that sincere to me. There's, they only seem to protect you. Like Clarence Thomas, it didn't do him any good. Margaret Thatcher, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, there are plenty of people that fall outside the white male um, uh, model, but they only get helped if they have a certain political point of view. So I mentioned when I was a graduate student, uh, I was the only woman in my class and no women uh, on the faculty. And, and that gave me a glimpse into what it is to feel like an outsider. At that time, black studies uh, programs started and, and women's studies and Chicano studies. And I could really understand how important those were uh, to find your ground, to know that the group you identify with made major contributions to culture and to human history. Um, I grew up in a family where, where uh, women were somewhat devalued, and I felt a bit uh, at sea in graduate school. So I can understand how important it is for groups to have places, rooms of their own. I mentioned Alma Hernandez, who works in North County as our field representative. Uh, she did a leadership training, and part of that, she created uh, Corazon del Pueblo. It's the first community center for Latinx young people in Santa Maria. And they did it so that they could celebrate their culture, their music. And you can't imagine how important that is to their confidence, their identity, their sense that they're worth, uh, and their culture is worth, and sharing. So uh, these, this is extremely important. And uh, you know, we, we have uh, recognition at the county of uh, this is Black History Month, and uh, we, we do resolutions and things. But we need to go a lot farther. Uh, in, in our San Inez Valley, we had a high school where a swastika was painted. And they quickly covered it up and pretended it didn't happen. So we led an effort to get the faith community, the political leaders, and others to write a letter to denounce this. Uh, and we brought in ADL to help advise us about how to deal with this. And uh, do I, could, could I get my rebuttal now and then just be done? If she chooses. Would, would you allow sure. me to do that sure. and then you can say thank you. Uh, so um, so we, we've had a number of meetings and we've learned that rather than confronting this head on, we're, we're planning a unity march, we're planning a common table, we're trying to be better than that and, and establish a code of conduct, establish appreciation for the diverse members of our community. And uh, it just, it, your life is so much richer to, you know, you have to get over a little bit maybe that, that if you enter a group that's different, but you learn so much. The world becomes such a better place, a richer place, a more exciting place to embrace diverse perspectives. So I, I'm eager and I think these are some of the new voices that uh, Jess has raised and who are here tonight and I'd like more <coughs> ideas about what more we can do. I don't get offended easily, so I'm not even going to say I'm offended, but I do think it seems a little arrogant to imply that I do not have a, a diverse group of friends. They just weren't mandated to hang around with me by the government. I sought that out on my own. I like, I'm a curious person, I'm very social, and when it comes to that high school thing, it's funny, I was just discussing this with my Jewish son and daughter-in-law, and my Jewish grandson spent the night last night for a second night, and we were saying, why don't they have a security camera? Because you know dang well that wasn't anti-Semitism. It was somebody trying to get a little something going. And I went to a Rotary meeting last week, and it went from one swastika to being swastikas painted all over the school. And the guy that was talking about it was so excited because he gets to do a diversity march. It's like this is divisive to always focus on this stuff. 
And once again, I am not convinced that there was any anti-Semitism behind that swastika. And, you know, nobody loves the Jewish people more than me. And, oh, one minute. Ah, Ratto. But I do not need a, a wet nurse to make sure I have a diverse life. That will conclude our questions for tonight. Now we will be moving on to the closing statements. We started with Karen, but we will end with John, to be fair. And the closing statements will be three minutes, just like opening statements. And here you go. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, John starts, because oh, you okay. started. Happy to do it. Um, there are no values more important to me than trust and honesty. And the large group of diverse local organizations that have endorsed me show that they have a solid trust in me to be honest, to have integrity. The Sierra Club, 350.org, the Center for, Biologi Center for Biological Diversity, and the Goodland Coalition the founder of the Gaviota Coast Conservancy, and virtually all of our community's environmental leaders trust that I will continue fighting for environmental protection and against climate change. The firefighters uh, trust that I'm committed to ensuring safety of the public, that I will get them the resources they need, and work with communities to enhance preparedness. The Planned Parenthood Action Fund trusts that I will be a champion to protect reproductive rights, and health care for women and families. The Cause Action Fund trusts that I will fight relentlessly for environmental, economic, and social justice and to address the needs of farm workers in our county. I have also been endorsed by Dolores Huerta and the granddaughter of Cesar Chavez because they too trust me to carry forward their critical work. The Central Coast Building Trades and the Home Care Workers Union trust my commitment to protecting workers' rights and a skilled workforce. The vast majority of the IVCSD and IV Rec and Park electeds trust that I will work with them in partnership to better the lives of IV residents and the community as a whole. And as I mentioned before, uh, one, of the, one of the most humbling endorsements is from Jess Alvarez Parfrey. Uh, she is going to help me find new and innovative ways to uh, get people participating in our community and determining the community's future. Um, and I'm very grateful for the lessons that she taught me. So um, her endorsement is one that I am most humbled to have um, and I'll work hard to deserve. I ask for your vote so that together we can keep moving forward to an even better Isla Vista. I will continue to lead the just transition to a green energy economy with environmental and economic benefits. Uh, I will support a more representative and inclusive county government. I will fight for progressive causes, including workers' rights and environmental justice. And I will protect your safety, our water resources, our open spaces, and our climate. That is my pledge to you. And I'd be honored to have your trust and your vote on March 3rd. Thank you. Um, I would also like your vote, maybe for different reasons. I know that, uh, once again, many of you probably agree with Joan and Bruce, because Bruce actually agrees with Joan. The big difference in Bruce and Joan is Bruce has a character problem. But they both come from a career in government. They both believe in big government solutions. Right here is an email from when Bruce was uh, serving on the high school board. And I told him that I was very uncomfortable with him taking big donations from people who were going to benefit if a bond was passed, a Sims Architecture, Jones Hall Law Firm, etc. And he writes back and says, there's nothing wrong with asking people who are going to benefit uh, to give back. So everybody who's giving him money, right here in writing, if anybody from the media would like to look at that, because I'm a candidate that isn't um, being funded by hundreds of thousands of dollars in donation, I am the only local person um, that is a native born, married to a guy who was born in the third district. I've got six grandchildren living in Santa Barbara County, two children who own homes here. 
And I think that I would be the great person to be in this race because as you heard tonight, Joan and I have very different, different uh, approaches to things. And the people who trust me are my friends and neighbors. And I'm gonna get a lot more votes than people think. And I've got great support right now in the Valley and it's making Bruce Porter nervous. He's actually throwing more money. He was hoping he could just tuck and roll, shelter in place until the general. And me getting in this has made him have to show his hand a little early. So you guys are college students and you like to do things that are meaningful. And I know when I was your age, even though I wasn't in college, I like to take full advantage of situations and make the most of them. You know, I call it a double or a triple play. Joan is pretty safe. She's the incumbent. And she also has, I don't know if she has 250000 or 350000 I have limited my campaign to $2,000. I've made my own postcards. I've built my own website. And I've got these beautiful signs all over the valley. And now you're seeing them on the 101 and out toward Lompoc also. Yes, even some marijuana farmers are putting them up because they know I'm 420 friendly, but I'm not corporate marijuana friendly. So anyway, getting back to what you can do, you can get your friends and classmates to vote for me, and it will not jeopardize Joan's chances at all. It will give her somebody that is a worthy opponent. I've shown up for every single uh, forum, as has Joan. I have always spoken the truth. Joan is proud, as she should be, that the Independent endorsed her. When they endorsed her, they, they had the caveat that I am an honest person and they respect me and they respect that I speak the truth. I could have come in here and pandered to you, but I won't. I do support fossil fuels, as do most of the people in the North County. And we would like to have a voice in our representation. So I would ask you all to consider putting me in the top two and having the two people sitting here tonight be the two people that sit here in November. I need your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Thank you to the panelists who came today and took time out of their schedules to share their ideas and initiatives and goals to present to you. And thank you for the audience for coming today and sharing your questions, your handwritten questions. And uh, thank you to the organizers. Uh, please uh, have a great night, have a safe night, and thanks again for coming.